Now, as we move into a new age of landscape painting, we encounter another of the great sung masters of landscape, that is Li Tang, and another, fortunately, from whom we have a major, large, uh, reliable work, signed work, and moreover, with a date. Uh, we'll see several other paintings associated with Li Tang, uh, and we'll see one with an old attribution to a different artist, which was long ago reattributed to Li Tong by myself and published as his work. We're going to see several signed and reliable works also by followers of Li Tong, which means that we can not only um, construct an oeuvre or a body of extant work for the artist himself, but we can also chart his following through mm, two generations probably. This is all very new and it allows a kind of art historical neatness that I haven't been able to do in the earlier lectures. Um, it's a neat enough pattern even to allow us to reject as Li Tong's work a couple of paintings, very fine paintings, which have one of them with a, uh, I think, an interpolated Li Tong signature, which for many years were taken to be the work of Li Tong, and big arguments went on about whether they could possibly be buying them. Uh, you'll see it. This is the Kotu in Landscapes, and um, I, I believe they belong much later around the end of Song. And I'm also going to begin showing in this lecture photos of real landscape, real scenery, uh, just to show how the artists were able to transform what they saw in nature into artistic forms. All these pleasures and revelations, I hope they're that anyway, are waiting for you in what follows. That is Lecture 9A. I'll give a bit of history before we go on looking at the paintings as, as before. Uh, beginning with the periods that preceded this, that is the Northern Song, from the late 10th to the early 12th centuries. The strength of the Northern Song uh, administration had been the civil service, the examination system by which people, men, uh, attained official rank through examinations. Um, the ideal type of scholar, statesman, colored cultural figure uh, had been established in the Northern Song. Men who were successful in the exams, that is, who were appointed to government service in the capital or in the provinces, uh, and they were rotated from position to position. Uh, the greatest height of prosperity was reached in this period, that is, the earlier part of the Northern Song. But in the late Northern Song, there was a general decline in the government, brought about mainly by the attempted reforms of a prime minister, or the equivalent of prime minister, Wang Anshur. 1021 to 1086, um, a person about whom there's obviously strong differences of opinion depending, depending on how you uh, judge his attempts at reform. He uh, was for, favored government interventions in the economy, uh, control of trade, something he called the ever normal granary, which stocked grain when it was plentiful and then dispensed it when it was scarce. Uh, controlled economy, he wanted to make the exam system more slanted toward practical ability instead of just knowledge of the classics. He was for government loans to farmers and so on. Well, he met with a, an entrenched bureaucracy and his it, reforms were in effect nullified by the reaction of this uh, conservative backlash. Haha, <laughs> excuse me, this is the winter of 1909 to 10. Excuse me if I think of poor Barack Obama up against the uh, Republicans in Congress. Okay, anyway. Um, so the, uh, the, this Republican backlash included people who uh, we saw as artists and calligraphers last time, such as the great Su Shi or Su Dung Po and Mi Fu and others. Um, they were part of this conservative faction. Okay. Then to the last emperor of the Northern Song, Hui Zong, what had been difficulty turned to disaster. Uh, he ascended the throne in 1101. At the age of 19, he was an aesthetic emperor. He had associated with artists and literateurs and others in his youth. Um, the brilliance of his court and the extra his extravagances further exhausted the empire, and there were peasant uprisings and other troubles. The Grand Counselor, the Prime Minister in our term, uh, this time a man named Tsai Jing, appointed in 1102, dismissed reappointed and so on, finally dismissed in 1120. He was another reformer, like Wang Anshur, uh, trying to reform education, the economy, agriculture, and so on. Wei Zhong, on the other hand, was increasingly obsessed with 
music and Taoism and uh, other, uh, other matters that caused him to neglect his rule. Now all this is the old interpretation from books from oh the 1950s and so on. In other words, things I read when I was teaching. Um, new books uh, can take a very different stand and I definitely recommend them to your attention. Uh, in the next lecture on bird and flower painting, when I talk about the painting of the Emperor Huizong and his court, I will recommend very strongly recent books by uh, Professor Patricia Ebry, University of Washington, and uh, Maggie Bickford, a respected colleague in the field of Chinese art history. Um, so uh, what, what I'm saying is I say it very old-fashioned, and we believe uh, they, they're more reliable than I. Meanwhile, the Jurchuns, who were nomadic people who originally lived up beyond the Liao, uh, the Ketons, that is outside of what we think of as China proper, um, had rebelled against the Liao, and uh, the Sung dynasty allied with the Jurchuns against what they took to be the common enemy, the Liao. And after this, after the Liao was put down or driven out, the Jurchuns simply moved in and captured. Kaifeng, the capital of the north, in 1126. Huizong was taken prisoner. Uh, the northern Song dynasty ended. Battles continued uh, between the uh, Chinese and the Jurchuns, and eventually the Huai River, a river that uh, runs to more or less the center of uh, China with the uh, Yellow River above and the Yangtze River below, Anyway, the Huai River was taken as the boundary between the two, the, uh, the Jin dynasty, as the Jurchuns called their rule. Um, the Jurchun capital was located at Peking, or Beijing, in 1153. Now, in 1135, the Song Emperor Gaozong, who succeeded Huizong, fled down to the south to Nanking, and first established the capital there, and then in 1138, established a new capital at uh, Winan, which in modern Hangzhou, down below the Yangtze River. Uh, a great general named Yue Fei was trying to continue the fight against the Jurchuns, but he was recalled, executed, and a really ignoble peace was established in 1141. There's still a shrine to him on the shores of the West Lake in Hangzhou, where you can go. Here is a view of the modern city of Hangzhou, seen from a nearby hill across the West Lake. The location of the Imperial Palace was around the upper middle of this image, or a bit to the right of that. Before it, and the great scenic attraction of the city, is the West Lake itself, a man-made shallow lake uh, divided by man-made dikes with bridges under which the boats can pass, and islands, very famous scenery known to everybody in China more or less. Uh, next, please. Looking the other way, we see these famous dikes and islands. Boating on the West Lake, where noisy motorboats are banned, has been one of the pleasures of Hangzhou from Song times until now. The southern Song, which lasted nearly two centuries longer, although it was politically weak and geographically cramped or constricted, was very prosperous, and the Painting Academy flourished, produced great masters, as we'll see, and we have a great age of painting, actually, for the next two centuries in this constricted area down on the south. I'll also show some things from the north, from the Jin Dynasty, but uh, separately. In an earlier lecture, I recommended highly as an aid to understanding what happened in Chinese culture during the Song Dynasty, the book by Peter Ball titled This Culture of Ours, uh, Intellectual Transitions in Tang and Song China published in 1992. I still recommend it highly, but now I have an addition to make. At a professional meeting in Honolulu last March, I ran into Peter Ball, and I spoke briefly with him, telling him how much I still thought of his book. He was pleased, but uh, he said also that he has a more recent book I should buy and read, uh, the one now on screen, Neo-Confucianism and History. I've acquired this, and I'm reading it, uh, those who have watched the previous lectures know how I want to see the big development of Sung painting, especially the rise of a monumental landscape tradition, against a background of Neo-Confucian thought. So for those of you seriously interested in this subject, 
I recommend this book without having finished, uh, finished reading it all the way through myself. Before I show and talk about the paintings by the first great major landscapist of the Southern Song Academy, that is Li Tong, I want to show two hand scrolls that were done under Huizong, or one in the one case, the second one shortly after Huizong. The first of these is by an artist named Wang Xi Meng, and um, who was born in 1096 and died in 1119. And the painting, a long hand scroll, was done when he was only 18 years old. Brilliant young man. And it was inscribed. You see the inscription here at the left of this, um, these two, two reproductions. Inscribed by Cai Jing, the prime minister, in 1113. And it was made to present to the emperor. Um, the painting is titled, A Thousand Li of Rivers and Mountains. And it's in the Palace Museum in Beijing. It's just 12 meters long and in, done in bright colors on um, silk. Well, this reproduction you're seeing now was published in China Pictorial, a picture magazine, and it's all we knew of the painting for a long time. So when we went to Beijing, this must have been in the 73, 1973 uh, delegation, uh, we were very excited about seeing this painting. We asked for it especially uh, because this made it look so, so great. Um, well, then, well, <laughs> I can only say the painting was was a strange kind of disappointment. Uh, let's have the next slides, please. Here's a section of it, uh, an actual slide, which shows the brilliant blue and green colors that are used throughout the painting. Uh, they must have given this young man real pots of blue and green mineral pigments. And of course, this uh, produces a landscape that not only has archaistic uh, tones, that is, uh, references to the past, back back to the powerful Tang Dynasty when blue and green landscape was used, but also signifies a prosperous, uh, fruitful realm and flatters Huizong by uh, association, by symbol, symbolically, so to speak. So it was a very, very much uh, a political move to paint this kind of landscape and present it to the emperor. Uh, but you can see here in the detail, here's a detail close up of some boats and people. Uh, the drawing of the boats and people is really pretty dull. Nothing happens. They're all just stock figures, uh, and the boats are not very interesting. And the trees are painted without any particular interest. And throughout the painting, that's true. Here's a couple more sections showing a house. Now, what we found is this. It was really quite funny and strange. Uh, the first five or six feet or so of the painting, maybe two meters, whatever, uh, the painting, as I said, is... Uh, is uh, is uh, how 12 meters long. No, I didn't say that. Very long. Um, okay. Uh, the first uh, two meters or so showed some sign of wear, as though it had been repeatedly uh, rolled and unrolled. But after that, after it rolled for maybe six, five or six feet, it was as if it were brand new, like it was painted yesterday. In other words, over the centuries, people had rolled a bit and then realized it was not really very interesting and then stopped rolling. And the last, the latter parts of it were just terribly uh, fresh and new. Well, as we rolled, it became, as I say, more and more apparent that this young man had worked hard but didn't have much real talent and didn't have much imagination and uh, put very standard uh, stock elements that he was painting, houses and figures and so on, and used a lot of this brilliant color, but no, uh, didn't really, didn't really uh, uh, produce a very interesting painting. Okay, that was that was certainly our opinion. As, as the, on the other hand, the um, a recent major multi-volume series of books on Chinese painting published in China, the Zhongguo Minghua Chuanji or China, Chinese famous painting complete collection. And their volume on song painting devotes no less than 25 color plates to this scroll. This is far more than any other artist or painting gets in this series. Well, it, I think the uh, the decision to devote so much to it was devoted, is uh, dependent on, oh, this question of imperial approval, Wei Zong's uh, and uh, Tsai Jing's inscription and the association with this famous emperor and the inscriptions and the authenticity and so on. In other words, this is a, this was a book reader's uh, choice to devote that much space and beautiful color plates to it, not by any means the decision of a, a painting looker. 
a painting looker would have chosen the painting we're about to see next, a hand scroll that for me is far more interesting. But this painting, attributed to Zhao Baoju, gets only a couple plates in this publication, the long sections of it don't really show much. And generally, this, this painting, Zhao Baoju painting, has not been published anywhere that I know of in plates that really show how, how fine a painting it really is. Okay, let's, now we're going to spend more time looking at that. Um, Zhao Baoju, who died around 1162, um, was a, well, let me talk about the painting a little bit before I come to him. The painting was, uh, carries a colophon, an inscription mounted after the painting itself, uh, written by uh, some early Ming mounters. And according to this inscription, a group of early Ming painting mounters discovered this painting and presented it to the emperor. They recognized it, that is, as a major work, an important work, by this famous artist Zhao Baoju. It isn't actually signed, but it's a fairly convincing uh, attribution. Uh, this is a scroll titled uh, Autumn Colors Over Rivers and Mountains, and is a long hand scroll. Um, well, as I say, for picture lookers, as opposed to uh, book readers, it's a far more interesting work, and I'm going to spend more time on it. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, we knew the painting briefly or distantly from uh, black and white reproductions that were published in Seren's book. Here's a general long section of it, not at all photographed by me. I couldn't make sections like this. I had to photograph it in a in a hand scroll case behind glass using my flash, and of course nothing like this is possible. This is from some reproduction. Well, as you see, the painting, it looks odd and maybe not all that great from the, um, from the um, uh, reproductions like this. And as I say, we saw it in something like this in, in Seren's book. And uh, in other words, a, a, a bunch of wiggly looking mountains or hills rising up, uh, cliffs and so forth, twisting from a far middle ground and uh, then various things going on down below, buildings and figures and so on, and two water courses, uh, river streams, whatever, coming out of the middle ground and flowing into the foreground to divide this middle, uh, this uh, extended foreground. Now that, of course, should remind you of the Emperor Ming's Hong journey to Shu, the painting copied after an early Tong work, which I talked about at length, and I talked about Tong landscape. Here it is. Now, you just, when you look at it, you see that essentially it's the same thing. That is to say, uh, twisting and strange peaks rising up in a distant, a kind of far middle ground, and then uh, a foreground with figures and uh, other things, uh, horses and mules and so forth, divided by two uh, streams that flow into the foreground, uh, out of the well, which way they're flowing is beside the point. point but which divide the middle ground. So there's something really, uh, something the artist took from a paintings like this, maybe this very painting, to make his picture archaistic. Now here are sections of the, uh, of, of the uh, Zhao Baoju attributed picture, again taken by someone else. Uh, as you see, um, a, lot, a number of, of uh, buildings and uh, figures and trees uh, in the foreground, and then up and up and among the hills, various uh, buildings and clusters of buildings. So it begins to look more interesting, but it's still nothing much there until you begin looking at details. Okay, now here is the here is a um, reproduction again, a slide from a reproduction. The color is all wrong of the beginning of the scroll, and at least it shows us what um, uh, what the beginning of the scroll looks like, even though it's not a very good slide. It presents a broad river valley flowing out of the distance into the foreground. And uh, again, figures and tr under trees and so on in the foreground. And then along the banks, um, clusters of buildings, villages, whatever, built along the shores. And on the left, the, uh, these twisting, uh, continuous ridges and mountains begin, overhanging strongly, over hanging over the houses below, looking rather dramatic and so on. Now, when we come in next, please, here's a detail of the houses on the shore. Um, well, it's obviously more interesting than the Wang Shi Meng scroll in the sense that it really, uh, the, the shoreline con uh, recedes convincingly 
and the uh, trees are convincingly, uh, what, uh, diminished as you go in a distance. And there are uh, geese on the shore here, you see, and the houses and so on. And then we go in closer here, uh, next slide, and next uh, image, I mean. And here is the uh, cluster of buildings. And you see things are really happening. People are inside and outside the fence, and people are uh, communing uh, and so forth. Uh, and the, the buildings are, are drawn by somebody who's interested in how they, how they are done. All right, now, now, now we will go on. I'll, what, what I can show you will be mainly details. Now, I won't even try to locate them in the whole composition. I can't do that. I don't have good slides of the whole composition. Here's another side of one of the sections, which at least shows us what the uh, whole scroll looks like. That is, it's on fairly dark silk with fairly heavy blue and green color, which, however, instead of solidly covering the form, simply is applied to sick parts of them on forms that are otherwise quite volumetric, treated with uh, up-to-date uh, ways of, of indicating volume and uh, uh, upper and lower sides and so on. I couldn't do this even this slide without getting bad reflection down at the bottom. As I say, it's really impossible to photograph a painting on a hand, hand scroll painting in a case. But let's go on and look at details, and um, we'll see gradually what, what, what makes this scroll interesting. Here is a section of the um, a detail of the, uh, uh, from the lower part of the scroll early on, and we see a man with a broad hat uh, riding a donkey through the landscape under the pine trees. Uh, beyond are mists floating through the trees, and a few flowering trees in the foreground. This seems to be this season it seems to be early spring. Uh, well, there's actually snow on the trees in some places. And up above him, a uh, uh, steps going up to a, a walled uh, house, compound, a house. Okay, the next. Here, here we come in closer. Okay, the artist uses the colors quite skillfully to model the forms and to give space and to render the mists. The mists floating through the trees are quite beautifully rendered and so forth. Okay, now another section, another foreground. Here, uh, a group of figures, uh, uh, a whole group of them making their way through the landscape, across a bridge, a kind of covered wagon, uh, ox carts, uh, donkeys again, and, and uh, figures, and uh, f flowering trees and other trees beyond. And then you begin to see up above the people making their way up into the upper part of this painting. Here again, next please. Here are the figures, two men, uh, high-class men, uh, merchants, who knows, whatever, making their way with their servant, who's carrying the luggage as usual in front of them. The two of them are turning toward each other, and in winter landscapes, and cold landscapes, this is often true. You see two travelers, and they look toward each other as though they're kind of uh, almost huddling together, uh, figuratively. We see this in a painting we'll see later by Liang Kai, a, a marvelous winter landscape by him, uh, similarly. Okay, then uh, next please. Or here's a detail in which the one of these uh, mule trains has, has paused to rest, and the mules are being allowed to graze and to lie down by the uh, uh, their uh, grooms. And meanwhile, the other people are, are sleeping or resting under the pine trees. Uh, in other words, interesting narrative details and a lot going on in the picture. Okay, now, okay, here is one of the longer sections which shows one of these two uh, water courses, streams, whatever you'd call them, flowing out of the middle ground into the foreground. And what, where it originates, as you see, is a hollow, a kind of uh, overhanging cave-like hollow, uh, with a waterfall falling into it. And all around it, these uh, twisting uh, bluffs and hills and uh, villas off on the left and so forth. Now, as you move in closer, the next, please. Here we go. This is a vertical uh, uh, slide that show, shows what, what's happening in the foreground. So in other words, you're moving back from a foreground that uh, has trees and travelers and bridges and so forth into things going on in the middle ground, and then up from that, up into the upper part, where still quite a lot is going on, as we'll see. Now moving in still further. 
when you get really into this cave-like space and where the waterfall is, you see it's really, really quite interesting. A group of people uh, here are standing on the shore, three men with their servant, two of the men, uh, one of the men pointing at the waterfall for a reason I never understood. When you have people gazing at a waterfall, one of them is, is uh, usually pointing at the waterfall as if saying, look, there's the waterfall. I don't know what the reason for that is, but it's a Chinese convention anyway, and we find it over and over. And if you look a little to the right of these men, uh, barely visible because the pigment has come off, you see the figure of another man seated on the shore, uh, dangling his feet in the water. And then quite uh, the quite beautiful uh, waterfall itself and uh, the pine tree done with heavy green color and, uh, and, and other uh, bare trees with a little bit of snow up to the left. Anyway, a really interesting scene as to as we have throughout this painting. You can see here, by the way, for the first time, I think, that the artist has used strokes of gold along the contours of some of the landscape forms to give a kind of sheen or light or whatever, is it, like sunlight striking them. Okay, going on. Here's another large section. As I say, I'm going through and showing details of this painting to show just what the quality of it is, what makes it interesting, without being able to um, um, show, to fit them all into some large scheme. Somebody else will have to do that sometime when the painting is really properly p published, as it hasn't been. Okay, here uh, figures making their way toward a cluster of houses in the foreground among uh, through bamboo, and then uh, up above that, uh, several people making their way up, st starting to walk up the stairs toward a compound seen on the upper left. And then in the upper right here, we see a traveler with a broad hat and his servant pausing on the path, making his way up toward some other uh, settlement, whatever, to look into a ravine, maybe another waterfall there. So things are going on all over, and one moves in imagination through the painting and, and climbs and um, penetrates the spaces and so on to see these figures. All right, next please. Further up, this is the place where uh, a man and his servant uh, have walked through a gateway or the fence and are about to climb the steps on their way up to this, um, up to this compound. And you, you see it with a courtyard and somebody standing inside. And you see it with galleries, whatever you would call them, open uh, rooms facing out so that people can, can eat uh, or drink there and gaze out over the um, scenery. Well, there's something like this at the end of the great Xiaogui scroll that we'll see much later in Lecture 11. Um, it's probably some kind of inn in the mountains where people can stop. Okay, next please. And here is the section where you see the traveler uh, with his, on a mule with his broad hat, uh, pausing to look into a ravine and pointing as though he's seeing something there. We don't know what. All oh, bits of mystery and bits of uh, drama and so on all through the painting. Now here's a slide, next please, which I show just to uh, show how the landscape forms are rendered in this remarkable work. Here down at the bottom is a place where the action of water, water flowing out of the distance, presumably, has eroded the rocks and uh, in strange shapes, pitted, uh, penetrated even. There's a place in the, uh, <clears throat> on the shore of the Taihu, the Great Lake in Jiangsu province, where rocks of this kind are so interesting that they're cut out and, and transported to gardens and set up as a kind of sculpture, so-called Taihu Shu. Um, well, this is that kind of rock, but er eroded by water. And you see here also the use of this rather spare use of green and blue color uh, to not, not covering the whole forms, not flat as in the Emperor Ming Huang and so on, but uh, used on forms that are otherwise rendered quite convincingly and volumetrically up to date. Uh, the next, please. Yeah, here is a mountain, uh, just to show these mountain ridges and how uh, powerfully and dramatically they are rendered, and uh, the rather sparing use of the heavy green and blue colors. This is a blue and green landscape of a kind that we scarcely see later. 
uh, the uh, typical paintings attributed to Zhao Bo Ju uh, are, are usually just with flat applications of blue and heavy blue and green color. These are decorative paintings and they exist by the thousands. I didn't say earlier that pictures attributed to Zhao Bo Ju are just endless, endless, because uh, painters of later times who did pictures of this decorative kind liked to write his name on them. His uh, zi, or his style name was Chen Li, a thousand li, a thousand miles. And uh, actually, I actually bought one of them when I was an um, officer in Seoul, Korea in the occupation in the 1940s. And it was one of three album paintings that started my career as a Chinese painting specialist even. That's another story. At any rate, there are millions of them, but they're, they're nothing at all like this. This is the real thing. This is what Zhao Bo Zhu might have painted. A major landscape master working in the academy, uh, working in the uh, 12th century, and using the blue-green style in a completely different way than we thought. Here's another slide of just showing how a large mass can be treated as a whole, its face uh, toward us, receding sides, something like texture strokes, but not much, uh, very, very sparsely used. And okay, here we go. Now again, yes, here is a, um, a detail of another, uh, another cluster of buildings in, up in the mountains, and a man entering a gate. Uh, it's a walled city, or no, village, or whatever. Maybe it's just a single cluster of uh, family dwellings. I don't know what it's meant to be. Somebody else can do that kind of study of this painting, and it would be very interesting indeed. And then another road uh, goes from this up to, the, uh, up to the upper right here and through a gate that you see. Next, please. Here's a quite wonderful slide of a passage in the mountains where a covered uh, walkway is built along the cliff to uh, um, allow uh, allow visitors to come to the uh, to the cluster of buildings in the upper left. It goes uh, through a covered bridge over a ravine with a waterfall. Quite dramatic and wonderful. And then uh, further over here on the left we see a figure who has made his way through this uh, walkway and is now climbing the steps to get to this villa. It's as though that as people have villas and uh, retirement homes, whatever, up in the up in the hills and people and other people can go there to visit them or whatever. Okay, next. Here's a detail showing again the uh, the green color and a, a path built along the cliff and a figure the as as in other paintings, the heavy pigment on the figures has largely come out come off. And this exists only as a kind of white image now. Now, going down below, I'm getting near the end. I really love this scroll, and I want to show some of the best places in it. Here's a passage where a man, seen a little bit to the right of the middle, is making his way along the path. He's come over the bridge, and he's coming into the foreground in a bamboo grove and a stream that flows from the middle distance into, into the foreground. And uh, bamboo diminishing in size. You go back a little, bit, a little bit of snow on the trees further on, blossoming trees. It is, as I say, early spring. And finally here, last slide. Ah, I like this one. Uh, here, in particular, you can see the seasonal indications. On the one hand, bits of snow still lying on the, on the branches of the trees. And on the other hand, blossoming trees and a, a red camellia, is it? Anyway, whatever, down here in the lower left, indicating that it's uh, early early uh, spring. And three uh, impress impressive figures again, men of some stature and their servant, uh, turning to each other and about to enter what seems to be some kind of a shrine. And you can see inside the darkened interior of the shrine, quite wonderfully depicted. Uh, okay, and up above pine trees. Now, for people, for visitors, excuse me, viewers of the time, uh, these details meant more than they do to us, or at least to me, because they must have known what kind of shrine this was and why the men were visiting at an early spring. And they had more, much more sense of what was going on in the picture. Uh, and if we think about how people read the painting or saw it, 
you have to realize that they they had it they didn't have to look at it in a in a glass case they had it in front of them on a table and they would be seated and rolling the scroll from their right hand into the from their left hand into the right hand gradually moving gradually leftward over the surface of the scroll and enjoying details they had to be pretty sharp eyed to see all this but they the way they enjoyed it might be not too unlike the way i've tried to present it that is seeing all these interesting things going on in it all this in a spatially unified and uh, so, so to speak geologically unified um, setting okay uh, quite a quite a wonderful painting and i i um, i haven't really said much about the the artist but let me do that before we go on jabba ju uh, is uh, is a uh, academy master who served under huizong in huizong's academy and then he became one of the next emperor gaozong's favorite painters in the newly founded Southern Sung Academy in the South. His specialty, as I say, was blue and green landscapes. We saw already examples of that in the Northern Sung, one by Wang Shun, for instance, who was a, a kind of aristocrat amateur painter. Um, Li Tong, we'll see, also did blue and green landscape. We'll see an example by him. So this represents some absorption of literati taste or scholar uh, scholar uh, amateur taste into uh, into painting in the academy. This taste for antiquity um, and for old styles. Jabba Ju himself was a, another distant member of the Sung Imperial family. He held some posts other than as a painter. He was a keeper of the imperial seal and so on. And as I say, there are thousands of paintings attributed to him, but this is the only one that makes much sense as a work of the uh, of the of the time and by a great master. I don't know of any other paintings attributed to Jabba Ju that have any chance to be genuine, but there is a fine scroll in the Palace Museum in Beijing that's attributed to his younger brother, Jabba Su. Uh, he held an official position as defense commissioner. He wasn't, that is, a proper academy artist, but was a person of some higher rank who painted. Like his brother, he specialized in landscapes in the blue and green manner that evoked the tongue. Uh, the scroll is unsigned. It's ascribed to Zhao Baosu in a call phone by Zhao Mengfu of the early Yuan period. There's also a call phone by another Yuan master, Ni Zan, and seals of famous collectors. The scroll was very much appreciated over the centuries. The opening passage, seen here, presents an arresting image of the sun rising over the sea with two cranes seen flying over the water and a rocky shore with pine trees growing on it. I haven't read anything that suggests a specific subject for the painting, but it's obviously an auspicious subject, and I strongly suspect that it's an illustration to the poem from the Book of Odes titled Tian Bao Jiu Ru, Heaven Protects the Nine Likenesses, uh, a poem wishing blessings on the recipient or the person to whom the poem is addressed. Next images, please. We'll see in a later lecture this painting by Ma Hujur, a slightly later artist who also worked in the imperial court, and whose major works are illustrations to the Book of Odes, with the text written out by the emperor under whom he served. This is the Tian Bao Zhou Ru Ode and his illustration for it. The first stanza of the ode reads this way. <clears throat> Heaven protects and establishes thee so that in everything thou dost prosper, like the high hills and the mountain masses, like the topmost ridges and the greatest bulks, that as the stream ever coming on, such is thine increase. The second stanza of the poem reads, like the moon advancing to the full, like the sun ascending the heavens, like the age of the southern hills, never waning, never falling, like the luxuriance of the fir and the cypress, May such be thy succeeding line. They're wishing blessings, that is, of many sons and grandsons and so on, a whole lineage of prosperous people following the person to whom the poem is addressed. Well, this is one of many paintings I could show illustrating this ode. The Tian Bao Zhou Ru theme becomes a favorite one for artists of the Ming Qing period doing auspicious pictures for presentation on birthdays, whatever. You can see one by the late Ming artist Wang Zhen Zhang, for instance, in Siren, Volume 6, Plate 299. Now, when we return to the scroll ascribed to Zhao Bo Su, 
Next, please. We see the sun ascending the heavens, the coniferous trees, maybe fir and cypress, and the beginning of distant peaks that could be intended to represent the southern hills. I'm not absolutely sure of this interpretation, but it seems likely. I would have to check it against the colophones, which probably mention the subject. I don't have easy access to them. Next. Further on in the scroll, the mountains continue in the distance. The rich green of the trees turns into large areas of green foliage or bushes. The shoreline below is seen hollowed out by the action of the waves, and a road appears above, here in the upper right, leading down into the trees toward the temple buildings of which the roofs are seen over the trees. The hollowing of the shore culminates in a cave, and more temple roofs appear in the upper left, now surrounded by clouds. They are probably the roofs of a Taoist temple in this context. Everything in the picture is richly mysterious. White birds, cranes, or egrets are seen flying over the trees, with a flight of them to the right of the cave. A rocky bluff in the upper left continues beyond the upper limit of the scroll. The otherworldly effect of all this makes viewing the scroll a strange and moving experience. Whether or not it's by Zhao Baosu, it belongs to the kind of poetic painting being practiced by aristocratic semi-amateurs in his time. The next please, the last. As the scroll ends, distant peaks appear again against the sky in the upper part, while below a near shore rises with tall pine trees growing on it, along with smaller trees under them. Many birds are seen in flight, and a bridge crosses the river, leading leading into the clouds and presumably toward the temples. And to complete the auspicious imagery, white mushrooms are growing at the base of the trees, presumably the Lingzhi mushrooms, which themselves stand for long life. Eating certain magical ones even brings immortality. So this is a painting crowded with auspicious wishes to some fortunate person who is the recipient, perhaps on one of his more important birthdays. Fortunately for us, paintings survive after performing their original functions, and we can enjoy this mysterious, entrancing work. Now we go on, then, to look at the work of another great master, very different, uh, named Li Tang. Li Tang is the next major uh, master of landscape in the, in the Song Dynasty. The Imperial Painting Academy continued to flourish under Gaozong, as I say, and some of the same artists who had followed him and followed the court down to Hangzhou were still active down there, and others joined the academy there and carried on the tradition, and generally carrying on the tastes and the styles of the Huizhong Academy. Li Tang in landscape was the major master there. His student Xiao Zhao, whom I'm leaving out, uh, but several paintings attributed to him that are important, and others, a painter named Leon Zhong I'll talk about next time, and we're talking about bird and flower painting. Um, Li Tang, as I say, was the next great landscapist in the Song Dynasty after Guo Xi. He must have been conscious of carrying on the great monumental landscape tradition, but under some pressure to conform to a new taste, uh, which is very different from the uh, what, what, what lay behind, the kind of thinking and uh, kind of the approach to representations that lay behind the great landscapes, uh, landscapes of the Northern Song. Uh, the, the idea of, of more poetic painting or painting that was somehow, uh, somehow embodied um, uh, a, a feeling of the, of the uh, artist, or anyway, a poetic feeling. Okay, Li Tong was born in the 1050s. He died after 1135. We don't know his exact dates. And the major painting uh, by him, which we have, very probably by him, is this one now on the screen, um, Whispering Pines in the Mountains. It's signed and dated 1124, reproduced everywhere. I put it beside the Fan Quan and the Gua Xi to indicate that these are, as I say, the three uh, signed masterworks, two of them dated in addition, uh, that we have from the uh, northern and early southern Song period or actually late, uh, the Li Tongs is still a late northern song. Um, this same juxtaposition actually took place in the Palace Museum in Taipei uh, back in 19, excuse me, 2008. Um, and here, the curator there, a man named Wang Yao Ting, 
good scholar, curator, uh, had this picture taken of himself standing in front of these great paintings with his family. And I don't have any other slide of them. Nobody was allowed to make slides. He sent this one out to some of the participants in the symposium. And um, I, so one of them sent me a copy of it. And then, so it's the only one I have. But here you can see behind them, if you ignore the family for the moment, uh, from the left, the, the uh, Li Tong paintings that we're now looking at. Next to it, the Great Guashi Early Spring. Next to that, the Fan Quan painting, the great work. And then to the right of those, uh, what I would take to be an interloper, uh, which I won't speak about in detail, but I'm just calling attention to it. A rather bizarre juxtaposition that was somehow managed uh, for this exhibition. Uh, in my view, it's as though we were to put, let's say, great works by Rubens, Rembrandt, and Vermeer in a row, and then next to them you put a painting by the modern Dutch forger Van Meeren. I think, in other words, that this is not a genuine old painting, but that's one, one uh, <clears throat> uh, view of my own, and it definitely didn't belong there. The mounting, by the way, if you, if you know about Japanese mounters, this is very probably the work of my favorite mounter in Japan, Meguro. This is the kind of fabric he used, to, he used in the way he mounted. And I think it was mounted by him at some point. Okay, beside the point. I put beside it just to, just for those uh, who has a little allusion for those who know, a, a picture of uh, somebody who would have really enjoyed seeing them together. That is Zhang Da Chen, uh, the famous uh, mounter and so on. Well, I won't say any more. I'll just leave this. For those who know our field, they will recognize my little joke. For those who don't, uh, we can do, it's all right, do without it. Uh, I mean, you can have just sort of wonder. Now, back to the painting. Here is the uh, 1124 picture. Now, you see immediately, <clears throat> let's put it beside the Fan Quan again for a while. You see immediately what they have in common and how they are different. They are both dominated by one large landscape form, one great bluff. And something like Fan Quan's practice of putting uh, shrubbery, uh, up on the top of the bluff uh, survives here. So Li Tong certainly knew Fan Quan's painting, and perhaps this very painting. And then uh, again, you, uh, you see the, uh, the foreground down below is a lot closer up. But the whole painting is much, much closer up to the viewer than Fan Quan's. Everything in Fan Quan's painting is quite distant. Whereas here, the large trees in the, in the middle and the easy entrance with a stream at the left, and um, what seems to be part of a path at the right. The only human uh, element in the picture, the only sign of human passage, not much less human habitation, is the um, is the uh, uh, this little bit of a path down on the lower right. Even that's a little bit unclear. In other words, it's something that is simply gazed at for itself. You aren't supposed to go in and explore and move around in it. You can't do that. It isn't that kind of painting. And it's, in that sense, really very, very, very different. What else can you say about it? Let's start looking at some details. Here, a, a slide of the, uh, the section in the upper left, which has the inscription. The artist, uh, Li Tong, writes the date and uh, gives his uh, birthplace, Huyang, and then Li Tong B painted it, drew, drew it, what it did it. Um, you can see here also, well, the distant needle peaks, but also the, uh, the, the way the, the surface is treated. Instead of the raindrop texture strokes, raindrop sun, uh, of uh, Fan Quan style, we see now what uh, the Chinese critics call uh, axe-cut texture strokes, as though, in other words, the surface had been somehow hacked with an axe. And it does sort of look that way. They are made by rather broader strokes made with a brush on its side and moved, moved away so that uh, so you get these kind of sweeping uh, strokes. And it renders some feature of the, of, the, um, of the rocky surfaces. You can see down below, by the way, pine trees. And as we look more, we'll see that they represent really two types of pines, some of them with rounded uh, bunches of needles, and the others, as in the upper left here, with more horizontal strokes, as though there were two types of coniferous trees. I don't know what they are. We can call them pines and firs for, for convenience, but there are two types of pines. Okay, the next, please. The whole 
uh, the whole upper section. When I wrote an article years ago on rocks in early Chinese painting, I ended up with Li Tong and was pointing out that he makes one big move uh, toward, uh, well, better, more visually, whatever, convincing or something, something uh, rendering of, of the rocky forms, particularly this one right in the center here. He, uh, ha he uses effects of sunlight and shadow. Let me say immediately that it's not consistent throughout the painting. The Chinese never do that. On the other hand, uh, it does, uh, there are uh, parts of the painting, like a line of, of light along the right surface here of, of a number of the forms, and then down on the lower, on the left, uh, left side of the forms, it relapses into shadow. And the main texturing is done on the areas in between. Uh, in other words, they're not textured evenly throughout. And this uh, somehow gives a sense of volume and uh, uh, is, is quite effective. What else, let's see, can we look at in this? Uh, here's, oh, here's a slide just to show you. Uh, this is a slide of, of shown, taken at Huangshan, but just to show you these rocky masses, like the one that Li Tong uh, depicts, are real and the kind of squared forms and the pine trees on top and so on. All right, uh, uh, yeah, and here is a slide of the left, left section again. The waterfall dropping in a dark ravine uh, on the left side. Well, as I say, it's, it's a kind of painting you gaze at and uh, receive a very, well, a, a very special impression. It's not just the world generally, as Fan Quan attempts at least to make it, uh, and it's something you, as I say, gaze at rather than try to enter into and find your way around. And all the old matter of the uh, uh, secular figures down at the bottom and then the temple part way up. Here, let's see, I think I have a, de a detail of the lower part of the Fan Quan that shows that. Yes, uh, here. Um, the, the mule train down below and the temple in the upper right and the pilgrim, all that is gone. Uh, and it's simply something uh, to be looked at in itself. Let's go on now. Oh, here's another slide of uh, Huangshan with, um, um, uh, mount, uh, with the rock f fractured and uh, make, showing forms that are not unlike those in the Li Tong painting. Uh, pine trees seen growing on the tops, a part split off from the rest, as in Li Tong. Uh, here a slide of the right section of the uh, Li Tong main mass, which shows us this effect of light along the right edges and dark uh, shadows inside, and particularly this form on the lower left that has a, a face uh, facing sort of up, up and right and, the, and so on, uh, uh, divided into faces and blocky, which gives it much more of a sense of volume than any of the forms in, in Fan Quan's painting. Okay, uh, here, this is the form of, um, this is a detail of the Fan Quan upper left, which shows his contours. And as you remember, he has a quite naturalistic way of drawing the contours, so the, the, the uh, with little projections and so on, which must have some geological referent. And in, uh, in uh, uh, Li Tang, something like the Li Tong paintings, the Li Tong style, something like this, only it turns into something kind of jagged, uh, almost geometric, as we'll see in other paintings. Okay, enough for this picture. There's lots more one can say about it, but let me go on. An another painting ascribed to Li Tong, uh, which is an, an important early painting at least, and probably by a close follower, is the hand scroll um, titled uh, a uh, Mountains by the River. Uh, this is again in the P National Palace Museum in Taipei. I would take it to be a work by a close follower rather than by a work of Li Tong himself. And, um, <clears throat> uh, but I, I could be wrong. Anyway, people could make their own choices. It's, this is one third roughly of the hand scroll. And uh, in general, it's diagonally divided with all the main landscape mass in the lower segment, and then the upper segment occupied by water and distance. And we'll see this to be typical of not only of Li Tong, but of Southern Song 
landscape generally and some, much other southern sun painting. Uh, here it's the uh, boats on the water and then uh, cliffs uh, by, the, by the river. And on top of them are buildings and trees. Here's the second section now. And the landscape continues to rise until it's uh, near, near the top by the upper left. And then uh, throughout the painting, there's interesting details of paths that make their way through among the trees and uh, houses on the top and so on. Here's, a, here's one detail of that. And I think you can see that the trees on the tops of the masses of the rocky forms uh, grow out of grassy mats, so to speak, as though, in other words, the tops of the forms are covered with grass and then the trees grow out of them. And you can see here also these two types of trees, the two kinds of pines, uh, and much more active, what, uh, genre detail, not genre exactly, but uh, human uh, occupation detail, paths and uh, walkways uh, with railings, and actually in one place a, 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 a dwelling. Okay, here's the last section of the scroll. And as you see, the main mass is very much like the one in the 1124 painting. That is a uh, big, more or less square topped with a separate part sort of split off from it, uh, vertical. And quite a quite strong sense of light and shadow. The waterfall over on the left as in the other painting. And uh, also in other parts of it, here is a detail. Um, uh, actual occupation. Uh, here is a thatched house and a brushwood fence around it and a man arriving back looks like a farmer with his hoe over his shoulder. And here also you can see the, uh, the um, treatment of the, of the rocky surfaces. Uh, here the, uh, the, the sun texture strokes are not so prominent. You couldn't do that in a hand scroll mean, meant to be seen close up. The stronger axe cut texture strokes we saw in the 1124 painting are suited to a hanging scroll looked at from a distance. Uh, the, this, is, this works better for the hand scroll form. Okay then, uh, before we go on to another <coughs> very fine uh, Li Tang attributed painting, more sort of attributed, I'll show this hand scroll uh, in the Palace Museum in Beijing. Uh, titled River Temple in the Long Summer. This is, I think, probably a genuine work, but in terrible condition, so damaged that it's scarcely to be seen. What we see here is the last half of the scroll. It's actually about twice this long, and it's again diagonally divided, in this case from lower left up to upper right. Uh, and then there's an inscription at the end, which I'll speak about in a minute. Uh, on silk, colors on silk. I'll have them slide in a minute with colors. Um, and um, yes, okay, next slide. This slide probably exaggerates the blue color. I remember it as being more blue and green, but at any rate, heavy color. And it's exactly this heavy color that has led to the terrible damage that has all but ruined the scroll. Uh, this is an example of what, well, I have an article in my reminiscent section of my website on what, what I call, what I use the Japanese term rokusho yake. Yake is burning and it's a, a disintegration of the silt chemically caused by this green pigment, mineral green, rokusho, uh, copper compound. And also blue may do it too, uh, azurite and malachite uh, mineralogically. Anyway, I have an article on this. And this is the very painting that I was looking at with several students and with an old friend and colleague, Chinese, who, with whom I'd been carrying on an argument for years about what causes this disintegration. He was arguing that it was a yellow pigment. I think it was wrong, and in my website article, I quote scientists and give various uh, evidence for what really causes this. At any rate, it's a serious problem with numbers of Chinese painting. And in this case, it seems to have pretty much, uh, you know, finished, finished off this painting. Now here are two slides, uh, which we can put side by side, bringing it up closer. Uh, you can still see something of the landscape forms, the pine trees on the top of these, uh, of these rocky forms, and uh, buildings and figures and so on, a few, uh, some of it. Yes, here in the one on the left, there are a few figures down below, and anyway. Um, 
Well, as I say, it's almost too far gone to really talk about. But uh, you can see that the forms, the landscape masses, are of this blocky kind, as though he is showing them with uh, different surfaces uh, in different directions. And um, this is something that we saw back in Tang Dynasty landscape. And in fact, he is recreating not only the heavy color, but also something of the landscape style of the Tang Dynasty. And uh, somehow bringing back that blocky uh, rendering of landscape forms that gave them volume, which I showed in uh, details from Tang wall paintings. And the upper left here is a piece of writing which is actually by the, supposed to be by, and maybe really by, the Emperor Gaozong. And in this uh, two four-character phrases, he makes a little imperial pun. He says, Li Tang ke bi, uh, Li Tang can be compared uh, Tang Li Sishun to Li Sishun of the Tang Dynasty. So in other words, Li Tang, turned around backwards, is Tang Li, Li of the Tang. Uh, let's say a pun. But he's, uh, in fact, uh, as a matter of praise, uh, connecting his court artist, Li Tang, with the great master of the blue and green style, Li Sishun. So, okay, here it is. Here's the remains of an important painting, more to be talked about than to be looked at. Oh, here again is another slide of, uh, of actual uh, t scenery. And you can see in the lower section here and in some others that there is some basis for this blocky treatment of uh, landscape forms. In other words, the fracturing of the rock sometimes takes this form and uh, and it, it isn't pure imagination to paint paint the um, paint the landscape in that way. Okay, now we go on to another painting. This is a quite, I think, quite wonderful uh, fan painting. I'll talk about fan paintings later, a very important subject in the Southern Sung art. And uh, this one is in the Palace Museum in Taipei. And it actually has an old attribution to Yin Wan Gui, the early northern Song artist, but that makes no sense. It isn't in that style. It's a meaningless attribution. In fact, it's very much in the style of Li Tang, as you can immediately see. I was the first one to what, recognize this and to publish it, and I published it in my Scarab book as a Li Tang style painting, as an, and, and an important painting in that sense. Now, several things, let's say several important things about it right off. First of all, it uh, shows this diagonally divided composition that becomes absolutely typical of Southern Song painting. And it seems to have originated around the time of Li Tong, maybe with Li Tong taking an important part in the, uh, in the popularity of it. If you draw a diagonal uh, line from the upper right to the lower left, most of the solid matter of the painting is going to be in the lower part uh, these uh, near closer uh, cliffs and pines and trees. And then the rest is uh, mist except for these peaks that rise out of it. Let me go on and say a little bit about the painting before, before looking into details. Um, paintings, as I say, associated with Li Tang, exemplify the idea of presenting scenic materials that arouse feelings. Uh, this is a new idea, not, not new at any rate in the late Northern Song, uh, very much re reflecting the preference of the Emperor Huizong, but also larger trends in the painting and landscape of the time. Um, paintings uh, that capture aspects of nature as it is perceived more fully than before. In other ways, it's, in other ways, it's a move away from naturalism. In other words, one can make arguments in both directions. Um, it, it's uh, away from attempts to represent the real world as it is understood in some intellectual way toward uh, more concentration on effect. Um, as in uh, Hui Zhong's uh, academy works, it's a matter of literary values being imposed on the pictorial, a kind of selected or idealized realism. As always, I'm using these words in a way that is rather unlike some realism or naturalism in Western art. So, but I've, I've done that throughout the series. So, okay. At any rate, this kind of painting runs through the Southern Sung, as we'll see, especially Southern Sung Academy painting. That is, pictures of natural scenery that arouse certain more specific 
kinds of feelings about the world, about whatever. Oh, here's a here's a slide I put in. Um, this is here's a, a, a photograph of the artist Li Tang painting this picture. Well, not exactly. It's a bit later, and it's a bit uh, maybe a different place. It's Huangshan again. I took it on the top of Huangshan of a Chinese artist painting, sketching, not painting, sketching the what he sees in front of him, and I use it to make a point, which is that Chinese landscape painting is always studio painting, done in the studio. It isn't done out in nature. The idea of actually painting out in nature doesn't appear in China. I don't, I don't know when it does, but in the West, as you know, it's 19th century, it's Barbizon School in France and so on. Uh, but in, in early times in China, and also in, in, in the rest of the world, the artist would make sketches in nature, maybe, and then would put them together in the studio to make a painting. But the, uh, the final painting would be done in the studio. Now, the, an early Yuan artist named Huang Gong Wang, very famous and great artist, uh, has a set of uh, admonitions or advice for painters. Uh, and among them is the idea that you should carry a sketchbook or paper uh, and a brush with you when you walk through nature. And when you see an interesting rock or tree or whatever, you make a sketch of it so you can use it later in your landscape. Well, that's what this painter is doing, this artist. He's making sketches that he will use in finished paintings. But the finished painting will always be done in, uh, in the studio. And here, and okay, this is, ha ha, this is a painting. This is, I didn't take these slides with anything like this in mind, but I have a big, a big uh, collection of slides of Huangshan in Anhui province that are useful for showing that Li Tong's needle peaks with pines growing on them are not entirely matters of fantasy. Uh, these peaks exist. And the, uh, the gazing beyond them into the uh, misty peaks rising beyond, all that has some basis in reality. Or here is a slide of a close-up of some rocky forms and uh, pine trees growing on them and mist beyond, which is a little bit like Li Tang. Okay, now let's go ahead and look at the de de details of this painting. Uh, here's one from the lower right. And you can see immediately several things that belong to the Li Tong style as we've already defined it. One is, of course, these two types of pine trees or whatever they are. Uh, a and B, shall we call them anyway. Uh, very, very clearly distinguished here. Another is the, ma uh, the nature of the contour lines, which have this kind of stepped uh, or almost zigzag uh, ver vertical, horizontal, vertical, and so on, as in the, um, the, the, the edge of the forms here in the lower right. Uh, these we'll see recurring in different ways throughout the, um, the work of, 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 Li, of Li Tong, or, or Li Tong followers, rather. Yes, just a minute. Uh, now here, another one. Yeah, they, this is fairly damaged. Again, it may be from green color. Uh, here is another a closer look at the trees and some of the uh, some of the ma ma rocky mass. Well, we again, as in the hand scroll, we don't use big axe cut texture strokes in a small painting. They'd be much too prominent, and they wouldn't work. Uh, it has to be uh, subtler and lighter and so forth for a small painting. Next, please. Uh, yeah, here we go. This is another passage of the. Um, of the pines and the rocks with this characteristic contour and the large mass in the foreground with a bit sort of shadowy look on the left and certain texturing done just at the point where the light and shadow somehow intersect where texture actually is seen on forms. This is in other words just a visual effect. Okay here another bit here uh, another detail uh, the the, the mists beyond the tops of the mist are well, kind of decorative, but there must be some naturalistic referent behind them. And um, uh, anyway, okay. And here the uh, slide of the uh, distant peaks, needle peaks with pines on top. I've shown slides that show these are not entirely made up. Anyway, a quite wonderful little leaf that is quite, uh, well, a poetic, evocative view of uh, pines and mist, uh, something very different from anything we've seen before. Before going on and leaving Li Tong, I'll put on briefly um, a painting of um, an autumn scene 
with a water buffalo and a herd boy. This is another subject that Li Tong is supposed to have done, and this could be his painting. It has a Li Tong signature, although it isn't really entirely convincing. This is in the National Palace Museum in Taipei. Maybe an early schoolwork. At any rate, um, maybe the tree foliage may be, may be a little bit too repeated. I don't know. Anyway, uh, a fine painting. Um, the um, it, uh, the season autumn is captured by the uh, the uh, co the red color of the uh, leaves by the fact that some of the leaves are blowing off. Here, I'll show I'll show a uh, a minute a uh, detail of it of the lower part. Yeah, here we go. Um, red leaves blown off the 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 buffalo is uh, mooing or at any rate making the sound that water buffalo make. The boy is getting water, scooping up water to bring for the buffalo to drink. Uh, here is a close-up of the water buffalo, quite beautifully drawn. Uh, it's uh, bridle hanging from its muzzle and on the ground, curled on the ground, little details like this. And elsewhere, strong drawing for the trees and so forth. Well, I'll talk about this kind of painting when I talk about one of Li Tong's uh, leading disciples, uh, Yin Ping who also is famous for this kind of painting and uh, uh, did a number of paintings that are attributed to him. Now, before leaving Li Tong, I will put on and talk about briefly and then bring back later a pair of paintings, here they are, <clears throat> um, that are, have been uh, accepted by many as his work, which I think are impossible as his work. Okay, this is quite an interesting story. These are two paintings that are in Japan and were preserved in a temple. It's one of the temples within the Daitokuji, the great uh, uh, Chan temple to the Zen temple to the north of Kyoto. Northwest is a section of Kyoto. Um, the Koto Inn. And um, they were side pieces to a triptych. The Japanese love to make triptychs and have a central figure painting. In this case, it was a religious painting attributed to Wu Daozi crazily. And then on the sides, these two landscapes. Okay, um, they, um, uh, two from a series of four seasons originally, but anyway, two surviving. Now, um, the one on the left here, you see uh, a, a group of leafy trees and then a branch projecting up above and a kind of a twig or branch putting, uh, pushing out to the right as though like a pointing finger. And then you can see a kind of blur, I don't have a detail of this, a kind of blur below that. Now that is actually a rubbed out, would-be signature of Li Tang. And the great scholar Shimada Shujiro, once my teacher, I talked about him in the first lecture, Shimada discovered this, uh, not only discovered this rubbed out signature, but managed to read it using infrared photography and found that it was a would-be signature of Li Tang. And immediately, these paintings were accepted by most of the scholars of Japan and quite a few uh, uh, abroad as important works of Li Tang. Well, this became a big uh, matter of controversy. I never, I myself never believed them because they don't belong in the style of Li Tang. I'm going to bring them back after we look at late Song, later Southern Song painting, particularly the work of Xiao Gui, and show that these must be post Shagwe works of the end of the Song Dynasty. Um, fine works, and very much to be treasured and appreciated. But next, please. It has a figure in the sort of far middle distance here in the lower, well, just below the branches of the tree. I don't, as I say, have a slide of the signature, but I used to say jokingly that the person who rubbed this signature out knew the style of Li Tang better than the person who wrote it in. Anyway, but it was, as I say, you know, it went on for years as a matter of controversy. The articles that had been written trying to salvage these paintings as genuine works of Li Tang would fill a book, a kind of misdirected book, because I think they're all going in a wrong direction. Um, well, one, one Japanese scholar, for instance, tried to extend Li Tang's period of activity much later so that it could somehow include these pictures. And what an American scholar, major, I won't name him because I think he was wrong, um, argued that Li Tang 
might have had two different styles, as Liang Kai, an artist we'll see later, had a fine style, academic style, and a rough, uh, looser style. And these would be the rough, looser style for Li Tang. Well, I think that person is now sort of recanted and come around to, to uh, putting them late, and so on. I think it gradually, uh, the uh, belief in them as as uh, Li Tang works will die away. They belong, as I say, and I'll bring them back in the uh, late, uh, late for the late song. Uh, here, let's see. Yeah, here, get again closer. You see this massive rocky form in the foreground. Now the Axe-cut sun have given way first to lar from small to large axe-cut sun, as they were supposed to be used in the works of painters like Maluran, and then beyond that into something that is uh, big, broad brushstrokes, giving a kind of flickering, dramatic light and shadow effect. Uh, this is this is very definitely late sun. The twisting of the trees, very unnatural. The um, the way the dian, or dots, clusters of dots, kind of hover on the edges of forms without really being attached to them. The next, please, here, going in. Yes, here is the, um, here is the uh, rocky mass. Well, you can't, if you know how, how art historical forms evolve, uh, you, um, you, you can see immediately that this is way, way beyond Li Tong and very different from Li Tong. Here, the next, please. Yes, here is the the section with the figure in the distance, a traveler carrying some kind of large gourd-like thing on a pole over his shoulder. And look at these twisting trees and the way the, um, the uh, twigs and branches are sometimes somewhat detached from them, and the way these clusters of dots, not really dots, but strokes that are along the edges of the landscape forms at the middle right uh, sort of hover over the forms and not, are not really attached to them. Okay, the next, uh, oh, yeah, this is even even closer and you can see it better, including this uh, figure. Okay, next, uh, the other one is a quite dramatic and wonderful painting of people gazing at the waterfall, a waterfall dropping in a rocky gorge uh, and uh, quite wonderful light and shadow effects, uh, very dramatic and uh, whatever. Look at the look at the up top here with this great broad brush stroke. Well, this is a long way from from Li Tong. Here down below, uh, next place, uh, up some trees here in the upper right, twisting trees again, and uh, one old tree down below with a very strangely twisting long uh, thing extending from it. Next, here is the uh, cliff with its face coming out toward us and broad, broad brush strokes taking us back on, uh, on both sides. Next, please. Here are the trees at the right of the waterfall. And you can see that the twigs are not really attached to the branches and the leaves and rather leaves, not leaves, okay. At any rate, it's done in a free and loose style, impressionistic, one is almost tempted to say. Uh, I'll take back the word, all right. Um, that uh, belongs to the late song, anyway. Here's the two people on the water next to the waterfall. One of them, again, pointing at the waterfall, as I say, typically done. Look at this very strange tree at the right, which is, you can't imagine something like that in Li Tong, because we've seen Li Tong. And here is the waterfall itself, quite dramatic, and a fine painting, a big, big uh, rocky mass, of which you see the the upper surface facing sort of upward and to the right is rendered only as streaks of white along the upper surface of these forms, as though you're seeing it at a very sharp angle and the sun is striking on this upper surface and then you see, and then it moves toward the shadow, the dark, dark. Well, that derives from Li Tong, but derives over centuries, maybe two centuries, any a long time. All right, now that's enough for that. Now we're going to go on and I will talk some about followers of Li Tong. Followers of Li Tong in the 12th, early 13th century. This, um, I used to use this as a kind of textbook lesson in style history, as we used to practice it. And as I still believe in it, although it's by no means, it isn't popular anymore, it's hardly done by anybody. But the transition, the move, stylistic move, uh, art historically, art historical move from Li Tong to later followers of his uh, uh, with an artist named Zhao Shergu, uh, marking a kind of end point, 
makes up a neat pattern of continuity and of devolution, the opposite of evolution, sort of downward movement, such as I tried to show already for the following of artists such as Fan Quan and Guo Xi. I showed works by their followers and showed how what begin as representational devices, elements of the style, style become mannerisms in the hands of the followers. Uh, anyway, this goes along for a while in the artist's I'll show, and then two great masters, Ma Yuan and Xia Gui, uh, coming along in the late 12th, early 13th century, transform the style and begin new phases in the history of landscape. And then we have the followers of Ma Yuan and so forth. The Chinese concept um, allows for this, the Chinese concept of movement from one artist to another. They use the term ibian, one turn, one twist, as though, in other words, the uh, uh, style goes along for a ways, and then it is given a twist and sent off in a different direction by a major master. Um, this term is used for what the major masters accomplish, how they alter or redirect the tradition. This still falls within Gombrich's uh, basic pattern, matching and making and all the rest of it, but it's a more radical, creative, even transformative process. Uh, anyway, that's very interesting, but I will show now just the sort of straightforward devolution. Okay, here to begin with um, is a fan painting by um, an artist named Yen Ping. Yen Ping active in the 1160s to 1180s. Yen Ping and his brother, uh, Yen Yu, whose work I'll show also, are the subject of a very good article by Dick Edwards, Richard Edwards, in Ars Orientalis, volume 10, for 1975. Um, the, the, the two brothers were sons of Yen Zhong, who was himself an academy painter under Hui Zhong, uh, and followed Li Tong as a landscapist. And they, the two young ones, learned from their father. Hereditary lineages uh, were fairly common in the academy. The Ma's, Ma Yuan, Ma Lin, came from a family of Ma's who had worked in the academy, and the names, at least, of the others are known. Um, the um, uh, Yen brothers came to prominence uh, around 1163 under the Emperor Xiaozong, who was the second Southern Song Emperor. Uh, recorded paintings by Yen Ping are dated to 1181-1187, and are probably late in his life. I will put in here uh, later a section on buffalo and herd boy paintings, attributed to him, and talk about those. But meanwhile, for now, um, <clears throat> here's a fan painting. Um, title, uh, uh, the subject is Villa Among Pines by the River. Uh, this is um, in the uh, Palace Museum in Taipei, and it's in the Possessing the Past catalog, uh, plate 85, where I discuss it at some length. Well, it's not so appealing, perhaps. It looks like just a sort of a uh, mass, uh, uh, dense mass crowded into the lower part of the painting and then the rest is empty. Uh, what's so interesting about that? But as you look at it longer and see more in it and look harder, you find that, um, you find that there's more going on really. Uh, that it's more interesting than it, is, it seems at first glance. Okay, we'll, we'll see uh, details. Next, please. Uh, yes, here. Okay, the subject is a villa a uh, group of buildings, somebody's retirement uh, uh, dwelling, or maybe a summer dwelling where you live when you're away from the capital anyway. Uh, built on the river, gaze, uh, looking out over the river, quite dramatically. A wonderful pine tree growing next to it. And <clears throat> when you begin to look in the details, you see down below here the place where the uh, boats visiting, people coming to visit this man, uh, arrive by boat the next place. Now here, uh, further up, is the, uh, you can see this dramatic pine tree, and also the uh, cluster of buildings. It's built on a rocky uh, knoll or cliff or whatever by the river. And in fact, what would be the courtyard ordinarily is occupied by a huge rocky mass, which is nicely textured in exactly the Li Tong way. You can see the uh, sunny side and the darker side where the texture strokes are. And the building itself is uh, quite extensive with uh, galleries, walkways, a uh, 
terrace or balcony here on the left side with a, with a railing where people can stand and look out over the water. And on the far side, you can't really see it, but sort of understood there is uh, uh, open rooms where the for, for gazing out over the river as one eats and drinks. And then the next, please, here, uh, as, as, in a kind of ideal narrative, one can, after, after eating, drinking, whatever, one makes his way, the two uh, main figures, let's say, the owner of the villa and his honored guest, make their way up this path to a ledge uh, with a railing around it up here under the pine trees uh, where they will sit and maybe uh, drink wine brought up by their servants and sit on these two uh, barrel seats, presumably ceramic seats, as, as you can see them. This is very common in Chinese paintings, uh, the indication of where people are going to sit and talk and gaze at the scenery. Okay, um, as I say, an ideal narrative. And then up here under the pine, we see more buildings, which are outbuildings of some kind or where the servants live, whatever. Okay, so it's really quite an interesting painting when you when you get into it and look at it more and a lot is a lot is going on all right uh, <clears throat> then here Yen Su Yu was his brother younger brother and we have a work by Yen Su Yu an album leaf this is his name written in Chinese in the upper right here um, in the Freer Gallery of Art this is one leaf from a famous album uh, which was brought together by a 17th century collector named um, Gang Zhao Zhong. Uh, anyway, and uh, part of it is in the Freer Gallery, a couple of leaves, and most of it is in the Palace Museum in, in, uh, in Beijing. Okay, anyway, this is, uh, this is a signed work by Yen Su Yu, and is uh, accepted generally as his work. And again, a painting with, a, um, with a, an implicit narrative uh, content, which uh, is, is built into the painting. This, in this case, a more conventional narrative. Uh, in the lower left, the path comes in, goes over a bridge, and you see a traveler on the donkey in the usual way and a servant carrying the luggage. And they're going to make their way along this path, up the bluff, through some bushes, and into this little cluster of buildings, like a small village, where undoubtedly there will be an inn and a place where they can maybe stop overnight, rest the donkey and eat and so forth. And then continue the next day, uh, the, the, the road going on is shown here at the middle left, middle right, I mean. Now, okay, among the Lee Tong elements you can see, look at this cliff up above in the right here, which has that uh, kind of stepped uh, uh, angular contour. Look at the pine trees. Look at the, um, well, the texture strokes, not much of that. And particularly the composition, which is all... Um, um, crowded into the lower part, except for one distant uh, group of distant peaks and and uh, seen in the upper part. The sky is partly darkened, showing it's evening, and the travelers are arriving by evening. Anyway, a quite lovely, uh, lovely uh, leaf and a, and a genuine work by this small lesser artist. Okay, the next now here. Okay, I'll put I'll put in this this one in just to sort of show the later stage and for our purpose the end stage of this development, devolution of the Li Tong style. This is an album leaf by a slightly younger contemporary of the Yen brothers named Joshua Gu. Joshua Gu in the academy, uh, active in the later 12th, early 13th century. He was the teacher of a much greater master, Liang Kai. Uh, he was a teacher as a figure painter uh, in the academy. And this is a signed work of his, an album leaf, Palace Museum in Taipei, uh, titled Temple by a Mountain Pass. This is in the Chinese Art Treasures Exhibition. Now here, and the detail beside it. Now here you can see the elements, as we've seen them, in the, of the Li Tong style, um, carried to, into the form of rather hardened school mannerisms. Here's the two kinds of pine trees, A and B, very distinct. Here are the trees growing out of mats of, of grass grow, covering the top of the, of, the, of the rocks. Here is the rock texturing done in a kind of simplified way uh, of the 
version of the uh, of what used to be texture strokes. Uh, okay, and then uh, two figures making their way into the uh, two pilgrims with uh, with uh, parasols, whatever, repeated. Here's that uh, uh, the contour of the of the uh, of the landscape form going chunky, 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 uh, as if sim a very, very simple uh, zigzag, and uh, heavy, heavy texture. The whole heavily textured part, uh, super textured, in the lower part, and then the rest of it very empty. Okay, so. We have taken the Li Tong elements and turned them into um, into mannerisms. The two figures are going to make their way along the path and through this kind of cave, and and maybe they'll stay overnight at the uh, temple, which is over here at the right with a flag flying, and then they'll go on the next day, maybe through the gate and on and so forth. All this very conventional indeed. Okay, well, all of this as I say very 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 neatly, almost over neatly. Um, it defines what I speak of as a devolution of the style from major innovative master's works down through the derivative works of the followers. This is, to be sure, an old-fashioned kind of art history, but it hasn't entirely lost its value. Uh, how this kind of art history works was analyzed, interestingly, in a book by a Yale professor named George Kubler titled The Shape of Time. This was a book that lots of us read and argued about and talked about and was really, really very interesting, still worth reading. Um, I should say immediately that doing this, fitting paintings into such a sequence, doesn't by any means exhaust their content or, or their interest. This isn't all we do. It's only a start. It's useful for dating them and setting up a series and sort of straightening out your work, your uh, 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 body of work. Okay, I'll show up a number of other album leaves by Li Tong followers just to show how this uh, other examples of, of this uh, very, very fine school. There's a lot of these from the Southern Sun period, some are quite fine. Here is one, a fan painting again. I'll speak about fan paintings in a minute. Um, very close to the Yen Su Yu painting in subject and composition. I forget who it's attributed to. It's in the Palace Museum in Taipei uh, with an attribution, but not one that means much, as I remember. Anyway, uh, the path coming into the landscape into the scene in the lower right in this case, a man and his servant walking across the bridge, about to make their way up the path to this uh, clearing on the top of the uh, top of the bluff, or the hill, whatever you call it, where, where you see thatched ho houses, the usual stuff, among the pine trees, same old pine trees, and then the, um, the road goes on at the right again uh, the next day. And down below, well, a moored boat, a few other things, but um, very, very much the same kind of thing. Here, next please. Here is one in a Japanese collection, I forget which, anyway, private collection, I think, um, which is actually signed by an artist named Wu Shu Ming, except that Wu Shu Ming is not recorded, so we have no idea who he was. But it's a signed work, and it's interesting as a Li Tong schoolwork, obviously, of the same period, roughly. In this case, two figures, uh, pilgrims of some kind, walking with staffs, are coming kind of the path from the lower right. One of them is pointing ahead saying, look, we're almost there. They are about to arrive at a uh, temple built on the mountainside, and they're presumably there, will stay overnight there, or rest, whatever, and then make their way. Here, the, the continuing road, which is always there, is way in the upper right here, very strangely moving up and then going through a pass. And the usual needle peaks and the usual pine trees and all the rest of it. Quite, quite fine, anyway. Uh, next, please. Oh, here's a very fine leaf, quite different. This is not uh, so conventional. This is a rather more original painting. Album leaf in the Nelson Gallery in Kansas City. I remember when they bought it, I was quite envious. I was looking for things for the Freer Gallery, and they found this really fine near Li Tong-style Southern Sun leaf and bought it. Um, here, uh, a... Uh, in the lower left, we see a farmer making his way over the bridge, making his way into the picture. But the main part of the picture features a, um, a, a waterside pavilion under the pine trees with a, a scholar gentleman in it, Gaucher, lofty gentleman, whatever. Uh, here's a detail of it, um, gazing at the, at the waterfall. Well, I'll stop sometime and talk about 
the implications of gazing at a waterfall and just what what this means and what how it turns out to have a quite scientific basis actually uh, I'll do that later at any rate here the cliff is uh, dramatic light and shadow the the some light and maybe a bit of gold along the well, near the waterfall here the water uh, colored and anyway a really fine dramatic leaf in the Lee Tong manner the next please here's a fan shaped album leaf unsigned but attributed to Li Tong in the Liaoning Museum. It appears to belong here among the works by followers of Li Tong. The style is in some features closer to that of the great later master of the academy, Ma Yuan. The broader brushwork on the main rocky mass, the way the distant hills are painted, the early evening sky, the extreme compression of the materials into the lower corner. Next please. Li Tong's distinctive method of um, treating large rocks with sunlit and shaded sides to bring out volume is kept here, but the old axe-cut texture strokes have given way to a looser application of strokes and washes with a greater air of spontaneity. Next, please. The huge rocky mass eroded away below by the action of the water uh, so that it's left jutting out dramatically may remind us of the boulders, although they're shaped differently, in the landscape of the rainstorm attributed to Mayuan in the Seikado in Japan, which we will see and consider at length in the forthcoming lecture on Mayuan, which will be a Lecture 11a. The old feature of showing two kinds of coniferous trees, one with foliage done in horizontal or diagonal strokes, and the other with rounded bunches of needles is retained here from the Li Tong Manor, but with the addition of broader brushwork, the further branches in upper right, the hanging foliage below. Next, please. A pathway comes down from the upper left, where further trees and pointed peaks make up the far distance. It bends leftward to disappear behind the huge rock and to reappear briefly just to the lower right of it, providing access to the shore of the river or lake. Next, please. Yes. Um, moving rightward, we see the Mayuan-like row of distant hills and the solitary angler in his boat. He is nicely located a short distance from the shore, where the water is deep enough for fishing. Next, please. A close-up of the man in his boat. A simple shelter behind him. He sits hunched over and concentrates on his quiet occupation. A few ripples around the boat help to define the water surface. Next, please. We are, of course, reminded of the famous solitary angler painting in Japan, attributed to Ma Yuan, another that we will see in the Ma Yuan lecture. And there are real resemblances. Both are details from larger compositions, in fact. The Ma Yuan attributed painting is really a fragment rescued from a much larger hanging scroll. The heavy horizontal cracking reveals that. But the re resemblance is not without significance. The Liaoning painting is best understood, then, as a fine small work by some Li Tong follower working around the early period of Ma Yuan, that is, sometime in the late 12th century. It could even be an early work by Ma Yuan himself, but that's only a guess based on style. In any case, it helps to provide a smooth transition from the Li Tong to the Ma Yuan style of landscape. This is uh, um, this is continuing with the following of Li Tong, but a very different kind of painting. This is a painting, the first part of a hand scroll, uh, in the uh, well, late 12th century work by an artist named Wu Yuan Zhe. Wu Yuan Zhe, Jin Dynasty. This is done on the north. I should say immediately that uh, the tradition of Li, of uh, Su Shi, Su Dong Po, and Mi Fu, and so on, the literati tradition, was carried on more in the north under the Jin Dynasty by that is by Han Chinese living under the Jurchuns uh, than it was in the south. There was not much of that kind of literati painting done, as far as we know, in the south in the southern Shen Court in Hangzhou. But in the north, there's quite a lot of it. I'll show a few examples, maybe in the last lecture. Well, this is a hand scroll representing the Red Cliff. It's in the Chinese Art Treasures exhibition. Siren has it and so forth. 
The attribution is actually made by Zhuang Yan, or Zhuang Shang Yan, this quite wonderful uh, calligrapher, scholar, great guy. Uh, I, I, he was in a group show photo that I showed in the first lecture. He was the director of the Palace Museum in the 1950s when I first went there, and uh, a major calligrapher and a major scholar. And he discovered that the copy of the, the calligraphy writing of the Red Cliff Ode by Su Dong Po, which follows the painting, to which this painting is in fact a kind of frontispiece, he discovered that in a recording, uh, recorded and managed to identify the scroll, which previously had been attributed to an early Sung artist, a nonsense attribution, and he found that it was really by this artist Wu Yuan Zhe, a little known, uh, somewhat scholar painter actually. At any rate, uh, it's a painting that represents the Red Cliff Ode, but uh, is somewhat in the Li Tong tradition. Here's the first part of it, and uh, it's an easy entrance with a lot of space, and then a river shore coming into the foreground, and then here the second part. <clears throat> here we see the great cliff towering above the river, and then receding up to the left, and then another foreground uh, um, landmass with pine trees growing on it. And on the river, uh, here, d detail, here is a uh, Su Dung Po, Su Shi and his two friends, table in front of them with their things to eat and drink. You remember we saw, we saw a, um, um, a long painting of this by uh, an artist named Chao Zheng Chang, uh, which was a 12th century painting, uh, showing all the sections of the row, uh, illustrating all the sections of the poem, the prose poem. This only shows the climactic moment. Most Red Cliff pictures we have, and I'll show others, uh, we'll see several more, uh, simply show this one scene in which uh, Su Dung Po and his friends are going past the river. Anyway, here they are, and then up above, we see the, uh, the cliff face. This is, strange as it may seem, it's a kind of uh, graphic reduction, reduction into graphic brushstrokes, that is, uh, and more the more for the amateur artist, more calligraphic, more brushstrokey, uh, of the Li Tong Manor, this uh, vertical thing and the and the diagonal recessions and so on. Well, if you, if you if you make a comparison, you'll you'll see this for yourself. It is actually the Li Tong Manor as carried on in the north and as turned to the needs of the scholar amateur. <clears throat> and here down below is the, uh, and the lower left, is the swirling water around the rocks and the pines being blown by the wind. Quite a wonderful, wonderful picture. Now, I think I'll stop here and then go on later with, uh, with paintings with political content. Okay, so much for this, this one. We'll stop here.